Fuzzy TV. As in the days of Noah, thus shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. For 100 years, Noah built a giant ship, a giant boat in the middle of dry land and was surely mocked, ridiculed. They attempted to put him to shame, but he persisted and he built a vessel that would be for the saving of the world. And the only reason you and I are here is because Noah built that boat. The only reason that generations in the future including all the generations on the new earth a thousand years from now. The only reason they will be prospering and reproducing and thriving and building and enjoying the presence of God on that new earth is because God is building another boat and he is preserving another small group of people and that is us the body of Christ we are what God is building today amidst the mockery the belittling the discouragement, the angst. We are the building, think of that, the building of God. And He is today preserving a remnant known as the body of Christ. And with that ship, with the preservation of the people in that boat, He is going to bless generations to come I say this again the only reason we are here today is because eight people obeyed God eight people heard God's instructions and were faithful to those instructions and for 100 years built a vessel that would be for the saving of the world. Today, we are being built into another kind of vessel. It's not made of wood. It's made of flesh. And the spirit that inspired Noah is not coming from without. It is inside of us. And because of our preservation, and our perseverance and our faith given to us by God, future generations will look back on us as the saviors of the world. We are only that because Jesus Christ was the savior of the world but he is also the savior of the body and he intends and will return all things to himself and build that new earth with us because we complete Christ and Christ completes the universe That would be Ephesians chapter 1. Speaking of the riches of His grace, 
I'm at the end of verse 7 going into verse 8, which he lavishes on us. And I remind you that Noah found grace in the sight of God. I'm telling you, we in the body of Christ are in a, in a similar position as Noah and his family were in that day. And I'm drawing a parallel based on our Lord's words, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. But I'm expanding that to tell you that God is building a body. Christ is building a body that will complete him. We are the pioneers of this era, just as Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives were the pioneer of that day. And the rest of the world was being lost. But eight people were preserved. Today, God and Jesus Christ are preserving you and me. And he is working with us, building something in us in relative anonymity. Certainly in people who are uncelebrated in their time in order to build a much bigger rescue vessel that will be for the Lord of God's glory and for the preservation of future generations. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 8 In accord with the riches of his grace which he lavishes on us in all wisdom and prudence God is prudently preparing for future generations. And now I, I'm skipping the 1,000 year kingdom and I'm going on ahead to the new earth because the new earth in Neon 5 is what God is building toward. I know he's eventually building toward the consummation of the eons when everything will be reconciled to him. But I am thinking today of the well-being of the joy and the happiness of generations upon generations upon generations of people, human beings who will inhabit that new earth, who will stream into the new Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven as a bride prepared for her husband. It will be so beautiful, so golden, so crystalline, so gem encrusted, so without death, so without pain, so without tears, that the generations will look back in their history books to find out how all of this happened. And the first entry in the history book will be the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, alone, forsaken, mocked, beaten, ridiculed, and killed. But the next entry will be those pioneers, like the eight who were rescued from world destruction. Next in the entry will be the body of Christ, whom God is today perfecting through trials and much pain because it is through much tribulation that we enter into the kingdom. And it's not unlike the tribulation experienced by Noah and his family who by faith built an ark, by faith the common denominator between Jesus Christ and Noah and us is faith that God is 
using us to build a better world. And this is not the promise of a politician. This is not a Pollyannish utopian pipe dream that we hear so often today about building a perfect world. This is a permanent perfect world. The new earth has no sea upon it. The sea is typical, that is, it's a type of the roiling masses of humanity who are tossed to and fro without a shepherd, without an expectation, without a vision. That new earth will not have a sea. It is solid. And it is founded not upon the promise of a politician, but upon God building a vessel that is so solid, so sure, and so seaworthy that it becomes the foundation of the happiness of generations to come. Do you understand what I'm telling you? We are the ark of Noah in our generation. So it's not simply that these times parallel the times of Noah, but that the building of a vessel that will save the world is also a parallel of what God's doing with us. I continue in Ephesians 1, 8 lavishes on us in all wisdom and prudence. What got me off on that was the word prudence. It's prudent of God to provide for the future. It, in, in that word, in here's forethought, planning. A sensible, a sensible foundation for a sure outcome. And it is prudent of God to choose us. It was prudent. You might even say practical. In all prudence, making known to us the secret of his will. Just as he made known to Noah the secret of his will and it was a secret because only Noah and the seven others who entered that ark were privy to the secret that God was about to destroy the earth and to start again with if you will a new creation making known to us the secret of his will in accord with his delight which he purposed in him. And here it is. Here's the secret of God's will that he is making known to us. Verse 10, Ephesians chapter 1. To have an administration of the complement of the eras. I'll explain that to you in a moment. To head up all in the Christ, both that in the heavens and that on the earth, in whom our lot was cast also, being designated beforehand according to the purpose of the one who is operating all in all. The phrase, the eras, is a very vast, pregnant phrase. The eras are all the times. Not just Adam's time, not just Noah's time, not just the time when Jesus Christ walked upon this earth, but all the eras are being 
filled up, that is completed. And we are the key to the filling up, the completion of the eras, plural. God is looking ahead to new and better, better eras. And he is using us to administrate that, to have an administration. of the complement, that is the filling, the completion of the eras, to head up all in the Christ. Toward this end, we are pioneers. And now would be a good time to show you the parallel with Noah in that there were eight common, dusty, ill-clad individuals who were privy to a secret and trusted that God knew what he was doing and that they were to hear and to heed his word. I'm going to go now to verse 21 of Ephesians 1, starting at the end of verse 20. God roused him from among the dead and seats him at his right hand among the celestials. This is where Jesus Christ is now, at the right hand of God, the premier position of power and influence, up over every sovereignty and authority and power and lordship. Follow this. He's at God's right hand, Jesus Christ is, among the celestials in a world and in a kingdom that we have never seen, but that exists today as I speak to you. He is there right now. And he is up over every sovereignty, authority, power, and lordship, and every name that is named not only in this eon, but also in that which is impending. Sovereignty authority, power, lordship. He is up over all. And this is our head. This is the one who is telling us his secrets. I don't know about you, but I have a feeling you will share my feeling here that there's nothing like having the one who is up over every sovereignty, authority, power, and lordship to be your friend, to be the one who is calling you into his confidence and whispering secrets to you just as he did to Noah. And he does this by means of spirit and by this, what I'm reading to you, the word of God that was also come to us by means of spirit so that we would know this, so that we would know that the one who has power over everything certainly has power over the circumstances in your life, the trials, the grit, the trouble. He's over every power, every sovereignty, every lordship that is named in this eon or in any eon to come. And this is the one who is today micromanaging you. Track with me here. He is today micromanaging powers, lordships, sovereignties and authorities. The same one who is ahead of all this is the head of your life. And he is fitting you to become, well, let me read and I will tell you what he is fitting you to become. After this vast grand description of where Christ is now, what his position in and what, what, his, what his position is and what he's doing, we hear this. And gives him, God gives Christ as head over all to the ecclesia. God 
has seated Christ by virtue of his faith to go to the cross for this whole thing to happen. Sets him above every sovereignty, every power, every authority, every lordship. And then when he's seated in this place with his power, he then gives him active verb gives him to the ecclesia the out call that's what that word means greek word ek out ecclesia called the out called he gives him to the out called what was noah in his day he was an out called there were eight people in Noah's day who were out called they were an ecclesia in their own right yes they were an ecclesia and they were called out by god from the rest of the world to continue life on this earth, on this earth. But what I'm engaging you with today is far beyond this earth. We're talking about eras, all the eras, and we're talking about worlds to come, and we're talking about that fifth eon, which will contain generations and generations, and it will be, I believe, at least 10,000 years of God dwelling with, with humanity. But what I'm telling you is it is founded upon what we are doing now we are the key we are the pioneers we are the out called group of people today who are being prepared to bring that world into existence and to be with christ the foundation of all the happiness and all the joy and all the peace that those people then will be experiencing we are alive today because of eight people Likewise, the people that will inhabit the new earth and Eon 5, generations and generations and generations of people, they are being built on our faithfulness given to us by God, Christ as our head. But now listen to this. He gives Christ to the ecclesia, which is his body. The complement. We are the complement of the one completing the all in all. This is quite possibly the highest, the most august, the most glorious, nearly unbelievable passage of Scripture given to human beings. And the reason it's so hard to believe is the same reason that it was hard for Noah to believe what God was doing with him and his family. What was God doing with him and his family? Preparing him to be the savior of the world, to continue the human race. That's kind of a big deal. The problem Noah must have had is the same problem that we have. I look out here, I'm in Fort Lauderdale. I'm in a Honda Accord in an alley. And the world is passing me by. The world doesn't care about me. Just as the world didn't care about Noah. There he labored day after day after day, putting planks together, hammering planks together and covering it with tar to make it watertight. How basic, how ordinary, how pedestrian is that? And he must have had his moments where he thought, this is insane. I'm marching against the will of the world. I'm marching against The, the, what, what the world thinks is important. Nobody thought that the building of the ark was important except for Noah. And yet he builds, he builds patiently, he builds, and then the day comes. On an ordinary day that had no harbinger whatsoever of the impending doom 
that day that Noah built the ark, that Noah completed the ark, was a day like any other day. And that's why the secret must be given to us so that we can know so that we can read and understand and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is what God is doing. And we need to remind ourselves of this constantly because what we see is no indication of what is coming. What you see today is no indication of what is impending. This is why we are to walk by faith, not perception. This is why our happiness and our contentment depends on not being fixated upon what is being observed, not noting, Paul says, not noting what is being observed because what is being observed is temporary. It's fleeting. It's passing. Yet what is not being observed is aeonian. What is not being observed right now is that fifth eon. I'm skipping the whole 1,000 years, which is also itself not being observed. And the struggle for faith is to fixate, to be intent, to camp around what is not being observed. Because what is being observed will take you down faster than anything. Noah struggled with this too. Our Lord struggled with that. Nothing he saw on that day was any kind of reflection of what was coming for him. I want to get through to you the ordinariness of the day of Noah, the casualness of the rest of humanity in the days of Noah, and that today we face a similar circumstance. But listen to this. He gives him, God gives Christ as head over all, the one who's head over all, to the ecclesia. The Ecclesia, this tiny group of people that is no more noble than Noah, the dusty man with his hammer and his nails, gives him to the outcalled, the very few people on this earth to whom God has given faith to believe what I'm reading to you today. The Ecclesia, which is his body, the complement, that is the filling up of the one completing the all in all. We fill up Christ. Christ is incomplete. As blasphemous as that sounds, it, it's, it's not. You've got to believe it. I, I can only believe it because I'm reading it. No one can make this up. We complete Christ. We're his body. He's a head. We're his body. He is not now complete. But once he is complete, we are the completion of Christ. It says his body, the complement of the one, completing the all in all. The complement of the one, capital all. We, capital all. We are the complement. That is the filling. We, like a puzzle piece that completes the puzzle. We are the filling of the one who is completing the all in all. In other words, the all in all is the ultimate completion. But that all in all, that is God being everything in everybody, which we see the real first sign of on the new earth. That all in all will not begin until Christ is completed. And Christ is not completed until he is joined, until the head, Christ is joined with his body. And then we become the complement of the one completing the all in all. And this, he is now whispering to us, to us, not to the world. No, no, no. He's not whispering any of this to the world. And this, again, from the one who today has authority over every power, every sovereignty, everything. Any sovereignty that is named in this eon or the eons to come. That's the one who is caring for us today. That is the one. He is the one who is orchestrating and planning our life and our days in order to build something of which the ark was but what was but a dim, dim type. He 
saved the world. But we, through him, will be the enactment of that. He did it. But as Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, 6, it is in the fullness of times that we will see and that the world will see the fruit of the seed that was planted at Calvary. And we complete him so that the fruit may ripen and the purpose of the eons, which is to complete everything and to bring everything back to Christ, may begin.